Hey everybody, welcome back to this series on Curse of Strahd for Shadowdark. This is part four in the series of campaign prep that I'm doing, basically. Um, I'll be talking about what I did, what we did in session three, which we played uh, yesterday, and I'll be also be talking about you know, kind of what I'm going to be doing for this next session, although there's not a lot of prep to do. I think this will be a bit of a shorter video because... Um, well, I say that now. We'll see how it goes. But I think it'll be shorter because uh, I have a lot of this stuff already done. Last session was awesome. It was really, really fun. Probably the best one we've had so far. At least I had the most fun. And I think my players did too. Um, up to this point, they haven't really they haven't really encountered any of the really Barovian things. I mean, there's been wolves and then they got to town and they sort of had this creepy vibe and have been building this sense of dread, I think, and I've been doing it pretty successfully so far and I really emphasize how kind of horrific it is. And they've had some creepy experiences, but so far they hadn't encountered anything, you know, dead, for example, undead, uh, anything really horrific yet. And um, there's that you know, difference between terror and horror, right? Horror is that growing sense of dread. Terror is the fight or flight adrenaline response to something that wants to destroy you. <laughs> um, and, and I think we've had a lot of horror building, 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 and then this session we had horror and then terror, and it was great. I mean, more for the characters than for the players, although one of my players was uh, at, a, at one point in the session, she had kind of her, her arms over her head and she was kind of leaning down and going, no, 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 and so I think she was pretty horrified, actually. Um, and she said it was really terrifying and it hit her it in, in like a really... <laughs> a really deep way. She was. She really enjoyed it. She loved it. She said she had a ton of fun, but it was creepy, and it really brought up that sense of horror, at least for her. And I think everybody else felt it, too. I certainly did. So, um, as I already talked about in, in the last session, the players had kind of decided to go to the church to get this book so that they could then go to... Um, so that they could then go to the, you know, the Zerpool um, Falls... Uh, this Airbull camp, I should say, the Vistani camp there. Uh, get the book, bury the Burgomaster, go to the Zerpool, talk to people there, try to find out where this attacker is, and if he's there, if they're protecting him, or if he's somewhere else. Um, that had been the plan. And then they were going to return to Barovia, grab um, uh, Irina, and then head to Velaki. That was the plan going forward, but that didn't happen. So they started off by going into town. I had, I had said that the last game, they hadn't saved Sorvia. She had been killed outside of the tavern by Father Donovich at night, although they don't know who did it. Basically, her sisters found her dead in the morning, drained of blood in this horrifying thing. And so they took her to Dr. Maxim. He's confused about what did it. Um, and, and basically, they were wailing and weeping. And so when the players came into town after having left... Uh, the Burgomaster's Mansion, which is on the south side of town, at the edge of town. When they came into the town center, they heard this crying coming from town, and they heard it coming from both Bildris Mercantile, where um, Vanya, uh, Periwimple in the book, but Vanya, as I'm calling him, was crying. This big man's voice was crying, and they didn't know who that was. They thought it was connected. And then they heard the crying and weeping from the blood of the vine. So they went there, and it turned out it was Alenka, who was mourning and, and enraged and furious and, and you know grieving horribly because her sister had been killed, Sorvia. And so the players realized, uh-oh, we, we missed out on this. You know, they thought, oh, if we had been here, maybe the things would have been different. Because they, they had gotten rooms there. They'd been tending to spend the night there. But then they decided to put all of their eggs in one basket and to go and focus in on Irina and Ismark. And so when they came back, they realized, oh, man, we, we really did focus on that. And there wasn't, like, regret, but there was a sense of, uh-oh, we can't do everything. Or we can't be everywhere all at once. And that's good because there's a lot going on here. And they can't choose to save everybody. They can't do it all. So it created this very um, dark moment when they realized, uh-oh, these people who the first day had been kind of just NPCs, right? And they had been there established by day two. One of them was dead. And so they, a couple of the characters went to Dr. Maxim's to talk to him to investigate the body to see if they could find out anything about it. The other two players went to where she was found, and they kind of investigated. And what Dr. Maxim said was that, strangely, this body is drained of blood, and there was no blood that I could find anywhere that this is strange, some, some bizarre thing. And they talked about the cult and he thought, well, maybe it is cultic activity. And then he sort of remembered something, but he couldn't put his finger on it because the way I'm doing this is that he's been charmed repeatedly by, by Gertruda. And so his memory isn't there. He's been charmed not to remember things, not to, to say things. Uh, and so he's kind of in a daze about some things. And so he, he 
keeps on trying to remember something and he can't quite do it. And so that kind of came across in the conversation where they realized that there's something more that he knows, but he isn't holding it back, or rather he's not lying. He just really can't quite seem to say it or remember it. So players were a little worried about that. The other two players, uh, the characters went to where her body was found and they, they found tracks that led to the church. So they, they know that whatever uh, put her there or, or killed her and drained her of blood went to the church. So they know that there was something there. And I had the player who's the beast, one of his abilities is he, had, he has advantage on perception checks that relate to, or, or wisdom checks that relate to smell and, and smelling things. And so I've been letting him kind of pick up on scents, uh, more like a dog or you know, something like that as we go through the game. And so he started, he picked up this bitter scent that he couldn't quite place. He'd never really smelled it before. It wasn't death. It wasn't rot. It was bitter. And it was near the body, and it certainly went to the church, too. So he knew that something, whatever was here, is still there, or went there. So then the players, the other two players who'd been at Dr. Maxim, sort of went around the town for a little bit. One of them went to build with Mercantile to try to find out if they could... Because, again, the plan was to get somebody to dig a grave so that they could bury the Burgomaster. That was still their plan, even though Sorvia was dead. And so they went to... They said they had seen this big guy, Vanya, wandering around town. And so they thought, well, maybe he'll do it. So they went in there, and he was crying. And so when they asked him, oh, are you crying about Sorvia? He said, no, no, no. I, uh, you know, basically in his very simple way said, no, no, I'm crying about Mary. She's sick, and she can't get out of bed. And the players went, uh-oh. Um, or that player went, uh-oh. We just talked to her you know, yesterday, and she's now sick. She can't get out of bed. And he said, yeah, she's sick. She can't get out of bed. And he said, so you know, you're so kind to take care of her. And he said, well, Gertruda helps me. And they were like, what? Uh, Gertrude has been gone, right, for a year. And he said, no, she comes back sometimes. And the players were like, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. And it started to start to click together for them. And then uh, they said, well, okay, can you help us? And so he agreed to help them dig a grave. And they promised they would go and check in on Mary. And so then as they did that, when as soon as they heard that Gertrude comes back sometimes at night, is what he said, um, one of the players said, well, we're staying at least another day. Which is great, because that was kind of what I wanted them to do. I wanted them to stay through that last day, perhaps. Maybe not the very last day, but the next day. Because there was a chance they were just going to leave. But he was like, no, we, we got to stay and see if we can do, do figure out what that is. So I think they're definitely going to have an encounter with Gertrude. But anyway, they, they, they gathered again. One of the players ran into Maud. Um, Arthur, the sort of more, kind of, not comic character, but he's playing his character certainly much more lighthearted. And um, at this point, still pretty... Uh, tongue-in-cheek, a little sarcastic, but not like just in a completely comic relief way. He does have serious moments, but he plays him pretty silly. Um, so he had this moment with Maud where there was this creepy woman who was certainly not from Barovia, and she made that clear. She was like, oh yeah, I'm new here as well. And so she had uh, a very different accent. She was uh, this old woman carrying bodies out of the houses and like swabbing down their mouths with, uh, with a handkerchief and then like tap, you know, plucking out eyebrows and eyelashes and stuff. And so the players were like, oh my goodness, that's horrifying. And one of them was like, definitely a witch, definitely a witch. But as I had suspected, right, because it's not directly evil, the players didn't feel like they had to stop her or anything like that. They were just like, this is a creepy lady and she's here. And so she talked to him and he gave a different name. He gave one of the other players' names. He was like, yeah, my name is Ulysses <laughs> instead of Arthur. And so she was like, oh, well, I'll remember that name. And then she said, if you ever, you know, if I ever see you, because he offered to help her. And she was like, oh, well, I'll remember that offer of help. And so it's kind of an interesting little bit there, but it was a pretty small moment. Then they all gathered in front of the church. And there was a sort of growing sense of, uh-oh, okay, so there's this body that's been drained of blood. Um, and, and one of the players said, okay, do we have any like folklore about vampires or anything like that? Do we, have we ever heard of anything like this before? And I let the two sort of more, their backstories that they're from this part of the world, they're, one of them is just like a woodcutter Poffel. He's you know kind of a folk person, just part of the, part of the peasantry. And that uh, Varya, who has been living in this part of the world for quite a long time and has done a lot of traveling. So I let them both roll intelligence checks, and both of them rolled very high. And so I said, yes, that there are these old stories of these things that live on the blood of the living. Um, but also, Varya, you recognize these descriptions from things that you found in your book. And I said that one of the things that these books have specified is that these things are destroyed by sunlight. They can't come out during the day. And so she was like, okay. So we know that at least. So we know that there's something really wrong. And then I described she, she has this curse which we had talked about in her background is sort of letting her see a bit into the spirit world. It lets her see, that's how she channels her curse and how she gets her powers. And so she said, she messaged me and on the side and said, hey, do I see anything in the spirit world? And I said, well, you kind of see shapes in the mist because there's mist all over the ground, right? It's really low on the ground. It's cold and it's in this time of the year. So there's mist where you see shapes of hands kind of like grasping at you or kind of warning you off or beckoning you on. And they kind of are all around the church. And so she was like, all right, well, I'm not going in there. 
I don't think I would go in there. I don't think we should go in there. And and Ulysses, the character who at this point was still he's the he's the noble, he's the priest background. He sort of thinks of all this stuff as like pious superstition. He's a priest and he recognizes that there's like maybe a higher power, but he doesn't think it intervenes. It's kind of an interesting character because he like has had this training, but he's a bit skeptical about it or about its value or something like that, which is really kind of interesting. And it played off really well in this in the session. But he was like, well, I'm going in there. It's, these are superstitions. There's probably dead people in there. That's sad, but we have to go get this book because we have to bury this man. Otherwise, you know, Irina won't leave. And so Pavel, who's, who believes in this stuff, but also kind of trusts in his own power, said, well, I'll come with you. And Arthur said, well, okay, I'll raid outside with Varya. So Varya and Arthur stayed outside where Pavel and Ulysses went inside. And Pavel's the beast, the woodcutter guy. And so they went into the church, and the first thing that I described was this sort of mushed, bloody dried blood sigil on the door that looked like a little bit like wings that were outspread but it was kind of like swiped left right it's actually the image i used for my banner in the background but i showed them that and i said this is what you kind of see spread on the door it's dried it's old but it's certainly very recent i mean you know in a few days old it's not like last night it's a few days and they were like okay what is that and they kind of got a sense of what it was so when they see the actual i think it'll be interesting is when they actually see the emblem of ravenloft either in Velaki or on the gates of Barovia or whatever it might be as they pass by the castle, they'll go, oh, hey, that's, that's the image we saw. Just it's, you know, you know not, a, not a bloody sprawl on the wall. Um, so they saw this symbol and they were like, something really bad is going to the church. And I described how the mist was kind of licking at the doors and open, in through the open door and kind of like was spilling along the floor of the church on the inside. So they went into the narthex and they saw that the other doors to the inside of the church were closed. They passed through, they opened them up and... Uh, the church was just this dark, um, cold, I described it, they could see their breath. And there were bodies scattered about the church, broken pews, and many of them were um, broken and had been like thrown. Some of them, I described as they saw a couple of them had been dropped from a height. And I had described that there was like a rafters and, and, and a gallery above them, so I thought, okay, maybe something was up there. They were dropped, but there was no blood around their bodies. They had been drained before they fell. And they're like, okay, so something is really going on in here. And then I described, it was really cool too, how the, the, the sunlight from the rising sun was coming through the stained glass windows. And so I described the patterns along the wall, the western wall of the church, and they decided to walk through the light. And so they kind of each had this cool moment, it was very visual, of them walking through this cold, dark church with these stained glass lights, you know, illuminating them as they walked along the walls, trying to stay in cover, but then also kind of they wanted this cool cinematic moment. So if they had really wanted to stay in cover, they would have stayed on the other side of the church in the darkness. But they're like, no, it's too cool, this image of walking through the, the stained glass light on the on the wall. And so they approached the altar, and there was this body that was kind of cast over the altar. And as they got close to it, it kind of um, started to twitch, basically. And one of the players didn't notice it. He was investigating one of the drained bodies on the floor. I think he rolled a one for his investigation, so he didn't find the puncture marks on the neck. <laughs> but uh, they, he, he, if he had, it would have been interesting because they would have been, okay, this is the same thing. But they, they suspected, he suspected that it was the same thing anyway. Um, I actually have the map here. I should have brought that up. Oh, well. Um, yeah, you know, no, no worries for me, at least. But... Um, so yeah, they were they were coming up into the church, um, and they came up along the left side, and then approached the altar here. And by the altar, they found this um, this body, which was starting to twitch. So the one player, Ulysses, who was examining the body, didn't notice it at first. But Pavel raised his gun and like his axe, and was like, "Hey, hey!" And then he looked up and he saw the body starting to twitch, and he said, "Oh, he must be still be alive." So you know, the one player, Ulysses, he's really doing a good job of playing this character like someone who does not believe that this stuff is happening. He's like, oh, they, he, he's still alive. You know, he ran over to him. And then the body, like, creaks up. And I yeah, described as there was this horrible cracking sound as the head, like, turns all the way around to view him. And there was this horrible zombie-like, you know, fleshy, decaying body. And uh, he was sort of in a panic. And I had them roll initiative, and they won initiative. They rolled stress tests, you know, tons of them. As <laughs> they were doing this whole thing, they were rolling stress test after stress test because this is all brand new. So they, they won initiative, and the player who plays the priest, he said, I just instinctually call out, you know, the, the deliverance prayers, basically the, the, uh, the um, turn undead. Like that was his first reaction. He was like, I cast turn undead because he, he knows that spell as a priest. 
And it was really cool because this character, Ulysses, has been, he's had this training, but he's kind of fallen away from him. He's not someone who, he, he doesn't really believe that it has all this effective power anymore. Maybe it did back in the ancient world, but it certainly doesn't now. But the first time he faces this horrific thing, he calls on it, and he rolled really well. And the way that uh, in Shadow Dark, the way that Turn Undead works is if the creature, you make a check, and then the creature has to try to make a charisma check. If it passes your, your, your whatever you rolled, then uh, it doesn't turn. But if it rolls under it, then it's turned. And if it rolls 10 or less, then it's destroyed. So he rolled like 15, and zombies are like a minus 3. So I rolled like a 4. So it got like, or like a 7, but it ends up with a 4. So this thing just... The fir his first reaction is to hold out his holy symbol to call it a prayer, and this thing just like instantly <laughs> crashes back to the ground, and the dark light passes out of its eyes, and it st lies still. And so they're both terrified. He and um, he and Pavel are, are terrified, but they, you know, they have this moment of uh, he at least has this moment of okay, this is real. This is absolutely real, or or at least he's starting to be like okay, I don't know what that was. I don't know what that was. I can't explain that. I can't explain that. So they went back further past that into the, the old sanctuary back here. And they find that it's like a library. There's um, some books. There's some vestments. There's a table and a chair. But in the middle of the room on the floor, there's this kind of gaunt figure wrapped in a dark cloak laying on the ground. Um, and the room smells terrible. And it looks like the room's been looted and that this body has just been left here. And then there was a door in the back of the room as well. So they were like, okay, well... Let's investigate. And Pavel's like, I go up and I tap the body with my, with my axe. And of course it immediately begins to move. But I saw it was a ghoul. But I didn't want it to just leap up and attack them because I thought that's, why would it be laying here if it were just totally ready to jump? It's not there. So I decided that it was like this, it was a cultist. They could tell that from the robes there it was something that, because Pavel had been a part of the cult and he, so he recognized these style of robes as something that belongs to the cult, but more like a higher priest or something like that. And so they had left the body here for some reason. And so it was wounded or it had been desiccated or decayed or something like that. So when it turned around, I described this horrible lizard-like face with red, black eyes with red pinpricks and this sort of long, you know, serpent-like tongue that's scraping along the ground. And it just sort of like hisses and kind of crawls at them a little bit. But it's very clearly weak. And so I had them roll initiative and they won initiative again. And immediately the other player says, okay, I, I turn on dead. And he turns it. He doesn't destroy it, but he turns it. So it like crawls itself into the corner and contorts itself and wraps itself away as this black, in, in trying to hide within the black cloak. So he's holding this holy symbol there as the other guy is kind of trying to find the book they're looking for. And they find the book. I think actually he was also searching for the book. And maybe he searched for it and Pavel just held the gun. But regardless, they, they, they held it there and they, were, uh, they found the book they were looking for in a couple rounds. So they had a few rounds left and they were like, well, we shouldn't leave this thing here. So let's kill it. And the way that, again, Turn Undead works in, in Shadow Dark, as far as I can tell, harming the creature doesn't end the effect. It's still turned for the five rounds. And so they started shooting at it. But they were rolling really low damage. They were hitting it, but they were rolling low damage. It has 11 hit points in Shadow Dark, and I kept that. But they rolled like two damage, and then like one damage, and like three damage. So it was super cinematic, because here they go, bam, 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 round after round, shooting this thing, and it's not dying. And I wasn't making it impossible to kill or anything like that. They could, they could hurt it, it just it wasn't killing it. So it was very cinematic. You know, you see in those scenes in the movies where they shoot the gun at the thing over and over and it's not dying. It's basically that was happening. And every time they were shooting it, it was getting more and more angry, seemingly becoming more and more alive as they were hitting it. Um, I was describing it that way, although it was taking damage. Finally, it, those three rounds are up of shooting and they missed a couple times too. Um, the one guy described it because his hand was shaking too much. He was missing. He doesn't have a high dex bonus, so he was shooting and missing pretty badly. <laughs> but the, the round ends, and it, and it goes, and they all rolled the same initiative, so it was tied initiative, so they all acted simultaneously. And so the one character rushed at it with his axe, Pavel did, to hack it, and it leapt at Pavel to slash him, and the other guy decided to turn undead again. So they all happen simultaneously, basically. Pavel axes it in the neck, and it doesn't die, because he did it. He got it to 10 damage. That's 11 hit points, so it was 10 damage. So it had one hit point left, but it was just like the, he hits it, and it still is going, and it slashes into him, and it did 6 damage out of his 7 hit points. So it almost turned him into the beast, because he's got 7 hit points. And so if he'd gone to 0, then he would have come, become the beast. And that would have been a whole other thing, but it did 6 damage. It did max damage to him with a slice, and he saved his con check to not be paralyzed. And then the priest held up the holy symbol and rolled like a 19, and the thing rolled like a 7 for its save. So it's destroyed. And so I described how the, the, the as it slashes into him, it's about to leap further, but then the holy symbol uh, and, and the calling out of the, you know, dispelling the undead or dispelling the dark spirit, whatever, the, the face 
for a moment looks normal and then the evil light leaves its eyes and it falls to the ground and the evil spirit has been that was possessing it basically has been cast out so it was like this horrifying moment the players outside are like oh man we've heard these gunshots going and going and we, we, we could run in to rescue them but our characters have said we'll wait out here and and so they're calling in like are you guys all right are you guys all right and so they, they called out yes we're fine you know and pavel was um so it was really great they got the book and they got back out and Ulysses was just like dumbfounded, right? His character, because he had been, he's like, this is not just, this is not superstition. This is not, you know, whatever evil is here, it is deep and it is, it is powerful evil. And it is, but my words also were able to drive it out twice. So he's having this sort of crisis, not a crisis of faith, but like a crisis of disbelief. <laughs> he's like, oh, I thought this was all not real. And now it's very clearly real. And his sort of instinctual groping back into his mind for those prayers paid off in character, right? I mean, like, he knew what he was doing. He's a priest class and he's casting a spell, but the character is just, you know, his instinct when he saw this evil thing was to call out these prayers and it stopped it. And then also it really worked out because now they're like, well, we shot in character. We shot this thing over and over and we hit it with an ax and it was still coming. So these things are powerful. These are not just ridiculous little, you know, zombies and ghouls we can kill by the dozen or something. This was one creature and we shot it. We had, we had it trapped in the corner and we were shooting it over and over and it was still not dying. And it, when it got out, it almost killed me. It almost knocked me down. It very nearly you know, sliced my flesh. <laughs> That's what Pavel was thinking. So it was a really cool session. We ended it just shortly after that. They had a lot of discussion this whole time the players were talking. There was a lot of table talk. There was a lot of role playing, um, in character discussion throughout most of the session. But that's all we did, really, was they went into the church, had these couple moments, and then came back out with the book that they needed. And I, it, we'd only played for about two hours, two 15 minutes, two hours and 15 minutes or so, and we called it there because it was getting a little late, and also, um, you know, we have work in the morning. So most of us were like, all right, well, let's just call it there. And again, I'm more of a fan, especially with this sort of campaign, I'm more of a fan of shorter sessions that leave people wanting to keep playing rather than overdoing it. So yeah, that was what we did. They didn't get to go to the pool. They didn't get to go to... Um, Anyway, they, they basically got through room one, two, past the altar three into four, and then back out. And I don't know if they're going to go back in. I described how they saw some bat droppings on the floor, the guano, and they were like, okay, so there's obviously bats up there in the belfry, right? Ha ha. Um, okay, bats, you know, yeah, we get the point. <laughs> there's something up there or maybe something down there. And so they know that there's more to the church. They could go back and investigate, but they have so much that they want to do. They have to, they want to get to Velaki. Vanya's like, we got to get out of here. We have to get out of this town. Uh, maybe out of Barovia entirely, although if they try that, they're going to have to get get through the mists, and that'll be good luck. Now, not that they can't, and I actually, you know, because this isn't set in a demi-plane, if they can find a way through the mists, they can, and I'll have to develop the rest of the world outside Barovia, but the things here are still going to be happening, and obviously they have to relate to it, so I don't know what they're going to do. They're not actually going to leave. I don't I don't think they are. They've agreed to take Irina to Velaki, so they're going to, I think in this next session, what they're going to do is they're going to bury the Burgomaster, they're going to try to, and I think this is what they're going to try to convince Irina not to bother going to the Zare pool, because in their mind it's just, the Vlissani aren't going to listen to them, they're not going to give up one of their own, we should just head straight to Velaki. At least through two or three of the players have said that, like, look, there's just no reason to go there. We need to convince her that this is foolish, and that we have a better chance of finding leads to the cult in Velaki than going to the, the Vistani. Which, there's a certain sort of sense to that. The Vistani aren't necessarily likely to give up one of their own. Um... So, uh, yeah, so overall, all in all, I thought this was a, just a really fantastic session. Um, they leveled up at the end. Um, I, I, I gave them a, a, basically a kind of extra experience point <laughs> just so that they could level up because they had gotten to nine and they needed 10, of course, to get to level two. And so I was like, well, you guys, yeah, I think it's fair. It's, it, you guys have now played three sessions. Let's get you to level two. But the nice thing about Shadow Dark is that at level two, I mean, the only... They each got a slight bonus. The thief got uh, an extra sneak attack die, right? He gets to do an extra dice of damage when he sneak, when he does a sneak attack. The cursed knight gets to do an extra damage three times per day for three rounds when she uses her curse. And I changed it so that, because the beast as written doesn't get anything except hit points. And so I changed it so that when he's in the beast form, he gets to add half his level rounded down to his damage so that every other level he still gets something as the beast. And then the priest gets one spell and he chose light. So they didn't get like a huge boost at level two. They did get some hit points. The cursed knight and the thief both went from one hit point to five, <laughs> um, which is really good. I'm doing hit points slightly differently where um, 
every time you level up, you roll your total hit dice all together and add your constitution or subtract it. And if that number is equal to or less than your current hit points, you just get one hit point. But if it's greater than your current hit points, you set your hit points to whatever you rolled. So that sort of helps to even out the problem. If you roll really badly for hit points one level, you don't get to re-roll it. But the next time you level up, you're much more likely to get a big boost of hit points that way. And I think that's cool. Um, so they did that. They, they rolled <laughs> not excellent. I mean, they could have gotten 12 hit points, the, the, the Cursed Knight. and the th Well, the Thief could have gotten 8. But the Cursed Knight could have gotten 12. Uh, instead, she only got 5. So she rolled badly, but she it's be 5 is better than 1. You know, <laughs> And so the same thing with the Thief. He's at 5 hit points now instead of 1. So they can take a couple hits before going unconscious or going into that uh, shock state that they have to roll for. Um, but Pavel and the priest, uh, Ulysses, both have more hit points than that. They're doing pretty well. So I'm not sure exactly what they're going to do in this next session. Um, I think they're probably going to go to the Zare pool camp, but I kind of already have it developed as much as I can. But now they've talked about uh, staying in town to deal with Mary and what's happening with her because they now know that Gertruda... Oh, and they asked him what Gertruda looks like. They said, is she sick? And he said, she's cold and she seems different. And so they're like, okay, Gertruda is not Gertruda anymore or whatever she is. She's dangerous, they think. And so they're going to probably, my guess is, maybe go to the Zerapool Falls in a quick little jaunt over. But it's not a quick jaunt. It's like a several hours. So if they do go in the afternoon, they're going to get back in the evening or at night, which means they're going to be awake at night when Gertruda comes and they're going to see her in her whole, you know, evil glory. And it's going to be made very apparent that they are unable to harm her. I mean, aside from turning undead, which I might make work on regular vampires, but I will probably remove that it destroys them outright. It might work with feral vampires, but I think I'm not going to do that. Because turn undead is so reliable in this, you just cast it. And it's, I'm going to try to get rid of that. So then instead, I think they're going to go there. They're going to see her. They might turn her, and so she goes to the corner or, or shies away from the thing. But uh, she's not going to be destroyed. And since she'll go out the window and run off into the night or ride off into the night or fly off into the night, as the case may be. And they're going to know that, okay, that there's... He also said, I think he said that she lives... Uh, yeah, yeah. Vanya told them that, that Gertruda lives in the castle. So they know that she's up there. Um, so they know that this is happening. They know that there's this, this vampire, probably. They don't know exactly what it's called yet. But they have the book where they can read more about it. Um... So, I can go back through here. Um, that day, Maud has already shown up, so I can remove that. Um, the sisters haven't left yet, but um, that's also done. Eric is also not gone. So these have not yet happened, but I think they'll happen when they, when they come in. And the next night, Irina is attacked again. Uh, at the place I'm not taking precautions, and it doesn't sound like they're going to be gone, so unless they, and if they stay at Gertruda's, then Irina's definitely going to be attacked and maybe taken. In which case, they'll have to go into Ravenloft to get her back. Um, or they're not going to know necessarily where she's taken. They're going to go to Velaki, is my guess. And then they'll, they'll think that that's probably where things are happening. Unless they think, put two and two together and find out that it's up in Ravenloft. They also might follow. This is also very possible, right? They might, they might, she might be taken. They might follow the kidnapper, who is a Luvash, into the woods. Track him down because, of course, the beast smells that. And then I think what would be really cool is, because it's a werewolf, they can't just kill him. They're, they don't have anything that can kill a werewolf, right? But they can harm him and scare him, maybe, and like and drive him off and do damage to him, so that um, maybe even, you know, somehow, somehow drive him away um, with fire or something like that. And so they'll rescue Irina from him, but the beast in the meantime will recognize that this is uh, not the thing. Or maybe it is, I'm not sure yet. If, if, I don't think Luvash is, is the one who turned him initially. It might be. It might be kind of cool if it is, and so he would recognize it as the one that turned him, and so now he has a personal vendetta to kill this Luvash thing as it runs off into the woods at night. Um, but, so, they're, they're going to be in town that night, and unless they make plans, Irina is going to be attacked and Mary is going to be attacked, and it sounds like they want to try to protect both, so that they'll have to figure something out. So, um, I'm going to leave all these things here because it seems like it could, any of these things could still happen. Um, any of these things could still happen because none of it has, has actually gone one way or the other yet. But I think either they're going to double down on Irina or they're going to try to maybe send a person to Mary and Vanya and try to um, reason or talk to Gertruda if she comes, whatever it might be. And in which case, they'll, they'll end up meeting a vampire. 
And I'm going to make it, you know, Gertruda has no reason to kill them. And, and also it's not her preferred method of attack. She's, she's a predator, um, a stealth predator, right? So she's not just going to like run at them and try to kill them. That's not her style. So if they are aware of her, she might try to something like that. But it's the first sign of resistance, or the first sign of a holy symbol or something like that. She'll, she'll run off. She's not used to that sort of pain or being opposed in this, in this state because she hasn't had it happen yet. So it's, it'll be new for her, the sort of pain of the holy symbol. So Gertruda will run off and um, be alive. But they will know now that they're dealing with that. And then, of course, Sorbia is still in town, although if they take her body, if the sisters take her body because she hasn't been burned, then they, um, there will be a vampire at the Vistani camp, which you know I think by the time they get there, they'll burn her body too. <laughs> the Vistani know those things. So I, I don't think we're going to end up with that sort of um, cascading effect of vampires that are just appearing everywhere in the town. It would be kind of cool, and if they don't do anything about Mary, then suddenly Mary will be one. They haven't dealt with Donovich, so Donovich is going to hunt again this night, so they might run into Donovich too. Um, and uh, then they'll have Father Donovich, they'll have Gertruda, they'll have Mary all running around the town. And uh, the, 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 the few townsfolk who remain don't, don't stand much of a chance. But if they can deal with Gertruda and drive her away, maybe then go to deal with uh, Donovich as well, then, then that'll be it. And I think Donovich is going to go for Doru uh, that night. Maybe I should add that in, because Donovich hasn't been dealt with. Yeah, that night. Um, Donovich... Father Donovich feeds on Doru for the first time. Oh, but he's a feral vampire, so he feeds on Doru, killing him and turning him. Yeah, killing him and turning him. Because Donovich is a feral vampire, he can't control how much he feeds. He just devours. So he'll. He's a little cunning. He's a little feral. He'll come to a window and scratch it. Doru will let him in, and then he'll devour, kill, kill Doru. All right. Well, I think that's all I need to prepare because, again, the uh, the session was um, short and it didn't they didn't get through the whole church. They didn't get to the Zare pool. They and they now are probably going to stay back in town and deal with Mary in that situation. And I know how that's going to go. I have the stats. I have the figured out. I know Mary's house, so I don't need to prepare any of that. So anyway, I hope this has been interesting. Um, I'll let you guys know once we finish the next session how it went, and I'll do my prep for the session after that. See you guys later.